Welcome to the 401k Audit CPA Success Show, where we're 100% focused on helping companies across the United States prepare for their 401k audit. If you have 100 eligible participants in your 401k plan, then this podcast is for you. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's podcast. Uh, Today, we are talking about a very timely issue. So it is um, close to the time for open enrollment and annual enrollment for um, employees to to get more people involved in their 401k plan. So we're going to re-hit on the issue, but take it a little bit deeper and talk about a couple different new things we thought of as well. So we're going to talk about how to get employees to to jump into your 401k plan. So welcome once again, Kim Moore, to the show. Thanks, Jamie. Glad to be here. Yeah, I thought this would be a a timely topic. from a couple of different perspectives, we know it's uh, folks do a lot of open enrollment either at the end of the year or, or the open enrollment period may actually be the beginning of the year. And uh, But they'll do a lot of meetings ahead of that open enrollment to give everybody time to make their selections. And I think a lot of folks, um, you know, if, if you're an HR um, folk or maybe uh, head of a company, um, there's a lot of folks that get involved in open enrollment, but they tend to focus on your medical benefits, your dental, stuff like that. Um, disability and voluntary benefits that you're offering, <clears throat> that's that's where people tend to put their focus. Um, but what we really try to steer people to is this is a good time um, to focus your employees on the 401k as well, because for, for a couple of reasons. One, you're offering a benefit. You should want your employees to participate in it. Otherwise, why are you offering it? And uh, we have a lot of um, clients and other folks that we talk to that <clears throat> that's one of their complaints is that the participation isn't high enough. I, you know, I'm, I'm offering this. I want more people. <clears throat> we know everyone needs us to, to save for retirement. So, you know, not having the people do it is, is a problem. And this is a good opportunity to bring it up again, you know, to just get it in, in front of people's mind. And, um, and then there's things you can do. We're going to talk a little bit more about that to, to try to engage folks, but it's also a good time. And one of the things I think that folks have seen a lot through the pandemic um, is that isolated kind of siloed thinking isn't a good idea. So to think about just my medical benefits, just in the terms of just the medical benefits, um, it isn't probably the best approach because we all know there's deductibles and co-pays and all that kind of stuff that impacts your financial health. And um, whether you have insurance or not <laughs> greatly affects your financial health, which goes into your saving for retirement, and your 401k. So I think it's it's better to get your employees kind of in a holistic mind frame when they're when they're thinking about even things like their medical benefits and which selections they're making. Um, certainly, it, what selections they make could impact their take-home pay, which could impact how much can they put in the 401k. So instead of thinking at it one at a time, have them kind of focus, like I said, holistically. So we thought this was a timely topic. Um, good thing as you're preparing to kind of to get to get in the mindset of thinking about it. But I wanted to talk about communication in general. Yeah, for sure. And I definitely think that um, the holistic approach is really good because I think when you have, when you're thinking about an employee's compensation, you want to think about all, everything that goes into it, right? So you want to think about the 401k, you want to think about the benefits, you want to think about bonus structure, profit share, salary. So I, I do agree that when you have this conversation, because you're talking about part of it, you're talking about open enrollment, you're talking about a couple things, like might as well just throw it all in there. And I, I can tell you a quick story from one of my CFO clients. Um, you know, last year they, you know, mid-year kind of decided, okay, we're doing all these benefits for our employees. They're taking care of some, they're not doing others, and there's some that aren't even offering. So let's figure out what they want. And they're a, you know, probably a 20 to 30 person um, ad agency and or um, you know digital agency and they uh, the things that the employees really wanted were more benefits you know they said you know profit sharing is great the bonuses are great but I would love for a, for the company to offer a 401k with a full match I'd love for um, you know to get more of our health insurance paid so the majority of the companies or the employees actually preferred those type of benefits to um, to just bonuses and so you know the, the, then when the end of the year came we kind of talked through what what are we going to offer for uh, 2021 you know that's when we you know went into opening up the 401k plan with a, a match and so again whether people are um, enrolling for it or not, they do want it. So like, you got to just make sure that right. you are helping them make it easy for them to enroll. I think we're going to talk about that a little bit as well. Yeah. I, I And I think that, uh, you know, the pandemic has changed focus for a lot of people, um, you know, in things we're not going to talk about today that don't have anything to do with 401k plans. But I think it, it really did change a lot of mindsets and um, it just kind of reset everybody. And um, a lot of the reading that I've been doing even in the, on the medical side, people are, they're valuing that healthcare. 
Um, a lot of folks have had to use it that never had to before. And so they're, they're learning more about, you know, all those things that they go into your coverage, the deductibles and the co-pays and, and which doctors can I see and how much of this do I have to pay for? And the same thing with the 401k. Um, we're hearing a lot more people uh, that maybe they knew about it, had an offering, and it was just like, yeah, I don't, I'll worry about that later. Now they're starting to think longer term. They are thinking more holistically about um, if, if I do this on the medical side, what does that do to my take-home payment? What is that going to do to my saving for retirement? And just kind of in, in general, um, I think they're, they're thinking a little differently than they, than they used to. So we thought good time for everybody to kind of reset their thinking from a company standpoint um, and make sure that you're addressing the needs. And one of the things I had on the list to talk about, and uh, you kind of brought that up, Jamie, is I think that too often the company owners or the officers or whoever's making decisions about the benefit plans, they think about what they think is good for the company base, uh, maybe what they're used to, what they liked, um, and maybe what they hear other people are doing. You know, so they're, they're kind of sitting in their office, uh, going down a checklist and thinking about it. Um, one of the best things I think you can do is ask the employees, mm -hmm. because you may think one thing, but if you go talk to them, I think you know the experience you had with your client, I don't think that's unique. I think you'd see that a lot, and especially after the pandemic, um, you know, and, and people's situations change too. So maybe you had a two household um, earning structure that may have changed. Um, I've heard a lot of people putting kids in private schools because of the school situation. Of course, that's very expensive. Mm -hmm. So for a lot of folks, their financial situation has changed drastically. And so maybe before they didn't care about company health insurance. They didn't care about a company form. Okay. But now they do. So it definitely time to ask you it was very eye-opening i'll tell you what like this was this is a very successful company and we've been doing a profit sharing plan for the last three years and i mean some of these employees were getting thirty thousand forty thousand dollar payouts as part of the profit sharing plan each year and again the the part that i think the feedback came was it was unpredictable like yeah it was great to get a, a forty thousand dollar check in january but it'd be a little bit nicer to get um something consistently month to month that you, you could count on and so again it was very surprising like we were put a lot of work into this profit sharing plan and we're always excited to cut that check and always thought that we were like, you know, doing a, doing a great job for these employees. And then you survey them and like, oh, actually, we, we just want our 401k matched. And, you <laughs> know, these, really prefer. <laughs> yeah, th these things. So it was, it was a very eye-opening experience for both me as a CFO and what I'm advising to my other clients, as well as to the, um, to the company owners. So yeah, I would definitely recommend communicating. And if you're a large company, you know, again, sending a survey out, uh, again, on, on a survey where you get all the results back and kind of see what people are looking for, I think it was, it was very helpful. So and I think it's from a, um, a company standpoint, I mean, whether it's a survey, it's, it's just a Dropbox kind of thing. It's just talk to people in the hall or put together a group, you know, pull some people from different. One of the, the other things that we're really trying to stress here is don't pull one group. So yeah. make sure, to, you know, you know your employee base. So if you've got younger and older folk, you've got maybe married with children and you've got single, but they all want different things. So make sure you're getting a good diverse group but put together a, you know, a task force or a committee or, or whatever you want to call it and just have those folks um, do some polling and then come back to you. And even if at the end of the day, they come back and say, we like everything, we really don't want anything different, you've involved them. That makes them understand that you care and you're trying to get them the best overall compensation, as, as you described, that, that's best for you. And as a, as a total company, you know, we're considering everybody, it just makes them much more valued. It's another thing that, um, again, we're hearing out of the pandemic is that, uh, you know, we're seeing the trouble hiring, a lot of folks leaving and that whole, um, we have a term for it. I can't remember what it's called. But, great resignation. Uh, the great resignation. Yeah. <laughs> they said one of the things as they're serving pe uh, surveying people, one of the reasons people are leaving is they don't feel valued. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with compensation or anything else. They just don't feel like the company is recognizing them as an individual and their contribution. Um, this is a way, you know, this isn't going to fix the problem, but it's one more way to say we care. You know, we care about you as individuals and we care about your whole person and your family. And um, so I think definitely 
I'm gonna, be a good thing to do. One thing I'm going to do, uh, Kim, I know we haven't typically done this for, for your um, podcast, but we actually recorded a two-session um, podcast on just the great resignation and basically with uh, one of our HR, both our HR guys and, and Jody and I just sat down and talked to them about things you can do for employees and what employees are looking for. I think that would be a great feed to add to your, to your um, channel. So maybe I'll put those two podcasts on there yeah. and we'll release those after this. That one. would be great. Um, I think that'd yeah, be really good think, for your listeners as well. I so. think so too. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, I would imagine that this topic is going to attract a lot of the HR folks. So yeah, for sure. You know, that would definitely <laughs> be in their bailiwick. So yeah, I think that's, that's a great idea. Um, great. One of the, one of the things uh, we wanted to mention first specifically to 401ks when we're talking about communications, there are required communications um, that have to go out. And we talked about these in other podcasts. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time. Um, there are required disclosures. There are different times of the year. So there are some that are required specifically um, around certain events. There's required um, communications around um, changes that you may make to the plan. Um, there's also yearly required disclosures, things like a fee disclosure or summary annual report. Um, I don't want to get into a whole bunch of detail on those because we don't we don't have time. And um, it it's best though I would recommend two things. One, double check with your provider because those disclosures are going to come from your provider. So if you use a, a third-party administrator, TPA, maybe you use a kind of bundled provider like a Fidelity that they, they handle everything for your plan. Um, in either case, whoever you're working with on a regular basis, double check with them and make sure that you've got a good list because the list will vary depending on what kind of plan you have and the different provisions. Um, so example, you have a safe harbor plan, there's a specific disclosure for that. So depending on what kind of plan, what, what's happening with your plan, what's going on, um, make a list, make sure you know what disclosures are required, when they need to go out, and most importantly, who's going to do it? Because we see a lot of times um, we'll, we'll be asking this as part of the audit and the, the client will say, well, the, the service provider does that. And the service provider, no, you know, we gave them the option. They didn't check that. So no, the client has to do it. So neither did it. Um, so make sure you know which disclosures, when they should be sent out, how they need to be sent out, who's going to do it, and put together a calendar. And then make sure you're going down the list, just like you would do with anything else. That's due in September. I make sure I, I've got it on my, my personal calendar to do in September. Um, the other thing we always like to talk about with required um, communications is one of the big things is when you have a new employee or they first become eligible and then when they leave. So we recommend you set up a specific procedure so that you're notifying people when you're interviewing them. Let them know that you have this 401k. Here's the provisions. Here's why we like it. Here's what I think is good. You know, really sell it in the interview. Obviously, when you're onboarding, same thing. And then you're going to let them know when they're going to be eligible. Again, different for every company. Um, have a procedure then when they're eligible. You know, don't don't just send them an email and say, there you go, sign up or don't, I don't care. You know, <laughs> do, do a little bit more. You know, that's that's a good opportunity um, to sell the plan. And then the same thing when someone leaves, it's good to do a kind of offboarding process in general. Um, but one of those things you should do is if the person's in the 401k, make sure if you can get them to leave the plan, that's your best option. That way you don't have to worry about keeping track of them once they're no longer employed. Um, if that's not an option, then you need to set up some other mechanism so you can make sure you can keep track of them. That will cause you no end of problems uh, on down the road if you don't do that. So I think the, the good point here is while these are regulatory required communications, it doesn't mean that you just do them as a regulation. I think the important thing is, is this is the first step. And the reason these are required is because you want people to enroll in your plan and you want to do everything you can to enroll in your plan. And, and you know, I think as an employee, as someone who's worked for several companies, you can tell when someone's going through the motions, you can tell when um, this is just, okay, let's, let's do our required communication, blah, 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 blah. And like, you know, we even had um, people say that to me, like, this is just required stuff. Don't even worry about reading it. We're supposed to yeah. that be like, yeah. Hey, this is, you know, 401k is a, one of the huge benefits we provide. Make sure you understand it. Make sure you know why we're doing it and make sure they get all that um, communication, both when they first are employed, as well as when they're eligible. Hey, congratulations, you're eligible. Let's, let's make you some more money by getting you, by getting the employee right. match. So. Right. Yeah. And that, you know, the match is a big deal. If you offer a match on the 401k, I always tell people that's free money. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's just sitting there. And if you don't enroll in the plan, you're, you know, it, it, it would be like, your, your boss coming to you and say, I'm going to give you a raise. And you're like, yeah, no, never mind. I don't want it. I mean, who would do that? <laughs> you know, it's, and it's the same, it's the same kind of thing. So, um, 
and I, I think that those communications are there for a reason. You know, the, the fee disclosure is a good example. Um, it's there to help people understand that there are fees that are deducted from your plan. Again, specific to every plan. Here's what they are. Here's why they are. Um, it, it's there to provide information. One of the things um, that, that I always try to stress with people is that those communications, whether we're talking those required ones or other ones, they can be very confusing. And I think one of the reasons people don't sign up for a 401k is they don't want to admit it, but they don't really understand it. And then they know I'm going to have to pick, you're going to give me a list of investments and I got to pick and I don't understand all that. I don't know. I don't know A from B and I'm afraid if I pick the wrong one, I'm going to lose a bunch of money and it, it's scary. And so they just say, I'll do it later. And then they never do it. Um, and we've kind of talked about this before about how people put it off and um, really the, to save for your retirement, you need to start early. It's very important that way it accumulates. Um, so I think the more that you can involve folks that really understand each of the components. So um, if you've got an investment advisor, if you don't have one, probably should get one, but um, go get somebody that understands the investments and can talk to them, um, not in the, you know, the legalese kind of language, but in, in a way to help them understand a bond fund versus an equity fund. Or in your particular situation, I'm gonna give you a, a little quiz and then that's gonna help you evaluate how risk averse are you? And then from that, I could recommend, you know, certain funds. I think if you offer that up to folks, it makes it a little less scary. And that, again, shows you care and you're trying to help them. Um, so I think that's a, another great way um, to communicate. We talked a little bit about open enrollment at the beginning. I think it's another great opportunity as you're doing your open enrollment meetings, um, involve your service providers. So if you're using that fidelity, you're using a TPA, um, spend a little bit of money and have the, and maybe it's not even money. I mean, if, it, if you're doing virtual meetings, you probably don't even have to pay to have them come to your office. Um, but just have those people online and available for questions. You know, give them five, 10 minutes of the presentation to talk about the plan. Um, have the investment advisor on there to talk about the benefits, you know, how if you put aside $5 today, that can grow into, you know, $1,000 in 20 years. Um, you know, th those can be very powerful presentations. And again, as people are thinking about how I'm, you know, which plan am I going to get into from a medical standpoint, and I'm talking dollars, that, that's a good segue then in, you know, just mentally for them to think about, well, maybe I could put aside a little bit of money for 401k and wow, I, I didn't realize it could grow that much. So I think involving those folks in the discussions as often as possible is really helpful. And I think especially if you have, um, you know, eligibility requirements that let's say it's a 90 day eligibility requirement, or it's a one year eligibility requirement, people are going to become eligible at different times. And I think it would be a wise investment of time to have someone maybe not from the um, outside, but maybe someone inside that understands it enough just to do, okay, you're eligible, let's just spend put an hour in your calendar to answer any questions you have. Because I think in a, a group of, I remember, I think I've told this before, my starting class at Grant Thornton was, you know, about 15 people and I was sitting in a room of 15 people that I, okay, these guys are all accountants. They're all smarter than me because I, I barely got through college or whatever. And I'm, I'm lucky I'm here. Everybody kind of has that imposter syndrome when they're first day on a job. <laughs> and and then you're sitting there with um, partners and people from the firm that are explaining this to you. Like no one's going to ask a question, right? And I think that's right. a, lot, a lot of people have. And so I think if you, okay, now that you're eligible, now that those 90 days are up or that six months or year, whatever it is, I'm just going to put an hour in your calendar and sit down with you and be like, okay, what don't you understand about the 401k plan? What, what questions do you have about the investments? What investment are you thinking? Can I help you think through it. I think that one-on-one -on -one conversation will get a lot more people to um, to really enroll. Yeah, and I've, I've seen it handled a couple of different ways with a lot of our clients. Um, some folks, they'll, just depending on how you're in your eligibility and enrollment works, um, they may have like quarterly dates. So everybody in a three-month period is all going to be eligible, regardless of when they started on a certain date. So if you've got something like that, I've seen a lot of times best practices is they will set up meetings just like kind of like an open enrollment meeting, but it's actually where they can enroll and they're just for the new folks. And they'll talk about all the benefits because just like we're saying it can be confusing on the 401k side. I mean, think about somebody signing up for medical benefits for the first time, how confusing that would be. And I've got all these voluntary benefits. You know, if I'm 20, do I want to take out dental and vision coverage? Do I want to take a life insurance policy out? That's different than if I'm 50, you know, so there's, there's different implications. So I think 
you know, that's probably a best practice is to have regular meetings where you invite in the people that have become eligible for your benefits over a certain period of time. Again, you would determine how that works um, and, and give them a chance. You know, you do your do kind of your sales pitch, uh, answer questions. And then best practice is if at the end of the day, the folks are saying, no, I, I don't want any of these benefits or I don't want you know, these four or whatever, have them sign a form. And um, we recommend that to all our clients, especially on the 401k. That way you can prove you became eligible. I offered you the plan. They declined. So if there's ever a question on down the road, um, and if you ever need an audit, that's one of the things we're going to ask for is do you have those forms? If you don't, we're going to have to go down and do an extra step um, that you can avoid if you'll have those people sign off. Um, so that's that's an option. I think putting the time on your calendar is another option if it's very you know individual oriented or maybe you're a very small company. Um, but I think you know that's it, it's a small investment, but it pay, it can pay big dividends and it again shows this new employee that you care about them. You want to make sure they understand. Um, you know, just it's a it's a feel good thing. So I think that's all good. Yeah, communication. I know that's what we're talking about overall here, but I think that's the the biggest thing when it comes to this is um, is making sure that the employee feels okay. They've the, the company cares about me, and the company's doing everything they can to make sure I understand these benefits because again, it, it can be it can be intimidating. You know, I think uh, like yeah. I said, I think back to my first one, and man, they they could have told me I'd have to like give a finger every month, and I wouldn't have raised my hand and asked a question about it because I'm so like, okay, this is the room where I'm, going, oh, this is the room where I'm not going to ask a question. <laughs> you know, yeah, no matter exactly. what happens, I'm not going to ask a question in this room. First, first exactly. Job, so. <laughs> um, one other thing I wanted to mention here, I know we're getting a little. Um, Kind of past our time here, but there are other timeframes when there there required communications. Things like you're making the investment lineup change; um, those are required communications. And they, again, we and we've talked a little bit about this. They may seem like here, I'm just giving you this. Who cares? Um, but they are important, and it's very important you make those disclosures to the employees because if anything blows up later on, and the employee is saying, "Hey, I got put in a fund. The fund tanked." I lost a bunch of money. Um, if you can't prove that you gave them those disclosures, you could be liable potentially for those losses. So um, they may seem like it's kind of a nothing. Uh, who cares if I really send it or not? Nobody's going to look at it, which may very well be true. They are important. So again, that goes back to making sure that you're checking with your service provider um, on all disclosures. If you're making any change at all, even if it seems like a very small, minor, nothing change to your plan, make sure there's not a disclosure. If there is, make sure it gets distributed. You know who's doing it and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, we talked about open enrollment, but um, with the pandemic, and of course, you know, we got listeners probably all over the country and people are in different situations now with the, the pandemic uh, kind of blowing back up again. Um, a lot of people have returned to work. And so some businesses are full steam ahead at, at work physically in the office. Um, a lot of them though are not, some are still very much 100% virtual or maybe a 50-50 split or a, you know, you can work at home some days, you can be in the office the other days. Um, one of the things that we like to point out is don't, if you've gone from the physical to either 100% virtual or a split, don't, negate all this communication or your open enrollment meetings. Don't say, hey, well, nobody's in the office. So, you know, we always had the, you know, the big thing where we had them in the conference room and we went through all the stuff and the PowerPoints. And now that everybody's at home, we can't do that. So we just won't have those meetings. Don't do that. And I think that's, that's why we're, we're doing this podcast and you're seeing a lot of um, other blogs and other material coming out as you're getting ready for open enrollment this year. Um, it's different. You know, and the communication may need to be different. Um, and, you know, virtual can be difficult to communicate tough, complicated things. So I think a little bit of planning up front is necessary to, to make sure you're giving everybody, you're hitting everybody, whether, the, you know, especially if you've got the split. So some people might be in the office, some people might be virtual. How are you going to handle that? Um, if you're communicating virtually to everybody, you know, that can be a nightmare. How are you going to handle that? How are you going to make sure you, you get everybody a chance to answer questions? You know, those are all things I think um, need to be considered as you're getting ready for this time period going into your open enrollment. 
Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point is it definitely times have changed. And I think, um, you know, if you don't have standard operating procedures around this, now is probably the time to document them and, and document, okay, how are we, how are we approaching this? Are we doing, how often are we having the meetings? Where are the meetings being held? Are we, um, again, doing it in Zoom? And how are we making sure we have attendance? You know, those type of things all should be documented um, for your own purposes, but also for, you know, again, Kim mentioned the audit a little bit, but, you know, I think if someone walked up to you and said, oh, here's our operating procedures, here's how we do it. And then they have evidence behind it happening. Like that makes the audit much smoother. And so I think just, um, you know, uh, we've, we talk a lot about standing operating procedures here at Summit, you know, we, we really, really focus on those and try to have everything we do documented and out there, not only to, for those purposes, but also just because it's nice to know, you know, it's nice for when yeah. a supervisor comes to your HR department, like, hey, how do we do this? Okay, here you go. Take a, take a look at this. It's yeah. just nice to have those well, on hand too. So when you have turnover, you know, yeah. You don't have to say, okay, now how do I do? I got to remember <laughs> yeah. it written down. Um, you know, and the other thing I think is for a lot of the bigger companies, they're used to, uh, we always do these in a certain month of the year. We have scheduled conference rooms. Everybody goes to the big conference room. We hand out packets to everybody. You know, we give tchotchkes to help, you know, and people look forward to all that. I mean, if you're going to do these virtually, how are you going to do all that? I mean, you're not yeah. going to give them paper packets virtually, right. um, you know, and people look forward to some of that. that it can be a very complicated, tough um, technical discussion, but it also is tough because you're talking big dollars, especially if people got to contribute to their medical plans. And you could be talking thousands of dollars a month. It's a lot of money. So um, they're difficult discussions and having it be a little bit lighter atmosphere. There's cookies sitting there, you know, that always makes it nice. Well, you can't do that if you're going to do it virtually, not like right. that. Now you can Harder. still do things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But um, you've got to, you got to put a little bit of thought into it. So that's why we're trying to bring this up and let people know, Hey, think ahead, try to come up with another way to do it. Maybe send some things to their home. Um, we, we've heard a lot about maybe at some kind of a virtual fair where you could go into a room a virtual kind of room and go room to room. And in this room, here's the medical providers. If you've got questions, you can talk specifically to them. If you've got a 401k question, go specifically to that room. Um, so that's something you might want to consider if you've got a good idea. technically savvy group there that, that can put that together. I mean, that kind of keeps that fun atmosphere, um, but allows for specific questions because that's the one thing you don't want to drive out. You want to allow people to have very specific questions um, about their situation. So all just kind of food for thought. Um, different companies have different needs, um, but definitely want to get everybody thinking about this so they're prepared when it's when it's time to actually have the meetings. Yeah, so we actually, um, you know, recently hired a, a new HR person to help us with some of this stuff. And, you know, one of the things that um, I know I've been spending a lot of time at, and I'm sure you have as Kim as well with your employees, is, you know, how to make a good first impression with your employees. You know, that's one of the things I talk with Josh about every day is, okay, okay, I want, I want to make the first day, the first week, the first month, and the first 90 days all very memorable experiences. And so what can we do to do that? And so we've added bunch of things and to your point is yeah you kind of have to be creative like you know what you just said with that virtual open our virtual rooms like I hadn't heard of that before I think that's a really cool idea you know we we just talked about doing like a virtual open house and so okay we hire you um, we used to do hire dates on Monday um, where people would come in and the first thing they do is jump into a meeting and, and we say okay let's let's move that back let's move hire dates to a Thursday and then um, Josh is meeting with them he's sending them donuts and coffee so that way you know there's a little bit of, of fun to it you know and I've always I've always joked um, at Summit and then again one of these days I'm going to take the step to do this, but, you know, we, on our Monday meetings, one of the things that people get volunteered to do is tell a joke. Um, so, you know, basically they spin a wheel, one person has to tell the joke and um, they come to the meeting with the joke. And so I've always joked, we should give a joke book to people on their first day. So that way they, they understand our culture. So um, I think that's something I, I want to take some action on <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe this year now that Josh idea. is here. So, yeah. Cool, Kim. Well, definitely appreciate the topic. And I think this is um, very helpful to our to our listeners. And like I said, we'll also um, release the uh, Great Resignation podcast um, right. on your channel as well. So that way we'll have some um, some content for the next couple of months. But I think this is a really um, timely topic and appreciate you bringing it. And any um, final thoughts? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, just everybody uh, be thinking about this. And uh, you got a couple months to get ready before uh, you got to be doing those meetings. So food for thought here. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Enjoy this podcast? Visit our website at summitcpa.net to get more tips and strategies for achieving 401k audit success. We're here to be a resource with ever-changing rules and regulations.